Earth Caribbean Antimicrobial Stewardship Conference is brought to you by BioMario, Meridian Bioscience, Lab Knowledge, and Farm and Pets. Curacao has become one of the Caribbean's top beach and water destinations. More than 35 beaches line the calm southern coast. In addition to private resort beaches, Curacao has splendid public beaches with crystal clear water and amenities including food and drink. Some charge fees and offer additional services such as showers and dive gear, even massage. Perhaps most alluring are Curacao's small, intimate coves and beaches. Beach connoisseurs can rent a vehicle, load a picnic, and create their own private escape. Curacao's abundance of coral and shipwrecks in shallow and deep water makes snorkeling and diving extremely popular. More than 70 dive sites surround the island. In fact, Curacao is named one of the best shore dive destinations in the world because of easy access to dive sites and visibility up to 100 feet. A popular day trip is the boat excursion to the uninhabited island of Klein Curacao to swim with sea turtles and explore shipwrecks. Another excursion takes divers to the Blue Room, an underwater cave off the west coast. Closer to Willemstad, the Sea Aquarium Complex offers experiences centered on ocean research and preservation. The Dolphin Academy trains dolphin experts, while the Dolphin Therapy Center helps children with disabilities. Ocean Lens is an underwater observatory for visitors. Offshore, the Curacao Underwater Park offers 19 dive sites, pristine reefs, and numerous wrecks. For a deep dive, visitors take substation Curacao to 1,000 feet below. Other favorite activities include riding the Aquafari underwater scooter and Seabob's powered underwater sled. Topside, visitors love wind and kite surfing and kayaking at Spanish waters and riding the Zapata flyboard at Yon Teal Beach. Watch the Land Adventures video for experiences from rugged to refined. My name is uh, Rudy LeBlanc. I am a clinical chemist and I uh, am the CEO also of Laboratorio de Medicos LabDemet in Curaçao, who has been servicing the Curaçao community for over 40 years now. Before the film array, uh, we couldn't answer questions that physicians sometimes have when they do their um, differential diagnosis. And that was something that was bothering Lab de Med for the longest while because we want to remain relevant for our community. So when we researched and found out that we could use the film array to help doctors do a better uh, differential diagnosis, we immediately went for it. Because uh, for example, uh, most of the microorganism causing flu-like uh, uh, symptoms are um, they are distinct however the symptoms could be the same so nowadays we can help physicians diagnose more directly and in a more efficient way because the film array also allows us in a very short time to give um, a result on 
I think it's more than 60 microorganisms that might be able to cause flu-like symptoms. Well, the film array is the, the test panel. The uh, options that we had in the test panel that gave us the opportunity, or actually, yes, that gives us the opportunity to uh, report out to the physician a, uh, a larger panel that they can uh, actually uh, diagnose a lot uh, faster, a lot more efficient. Oh, absolutely not, because we were actually looking for a good solution, like um, to answer the questions that our physicians had. And we wanted to be and wants to be um, relevant to our community. A rapid diagnosis, client satisfaction, patient satisfaction, and quick response turnaround time and relief, quick relief of symptoms and patient problems. This video explains how to use the Acquisition Station software to run a Vitec MSDS target slide on the Vitec MS instrument. At the end of this video, you should be able to run a target slide on the Vitec MS instrument using the Acquisition Station software. Required materials a Vitec MS Acquisition Station computer and software, a monitor, a keyboard and mouse, a barcode scanner. Vitec MS instrument and a prepared Vitec MSDS target slide. Note, slides should be tested within 48 hours of sample preparation. The Vitec MS acquisition station software is used to monitor and display the instrument status, perform sample analysis activities, and can display previously acquired spectra. This video will focus on sample analysis activities and the steps used to acquire spectra from a Vitec MSDS target slide. If necessary, log into Windows on the PC by pressing Ctrl-Alt-Delete on the keyboard. Enter a Windows username and password. Note, if you have a Vitec MS Plus, double-click the switcher icon on the desktop and verify the system is in IVD mode. On the Windows desktop, double-click the Vitec MS Acquisition Station icon to launch the software. Log into the Acquisition Station software by entering a Milo username and password with Vitec MS Tech Privileges. The Acquisition screen displays by default. The screen is divided into several sections. The Title Bar, the Navigation Bar, the Progress Display, the Camera Viewer, the Spectrum Display, the Action Buttons, the Information Display, and the Logout Button. Verify all Vitec MS Target Slides to be tested are completely dry. Wearing powder-free gloves, click the Open button on the right side of the screen. The sound of valves pulsing and hissing can be heard as pressure is released from the system. The pressure must reach approximately plus three millibars before the door will open. This takes just a few minutes and can be monitored on the lower part of the screen as the source pressure bar changes from green to orange. When the Vitec MS instrument door opens, remove the adapter from the carrier. If present, remove any previously tested slides and store or discard according to your laboratory procedures. Place the target slides into the adapter in order beginning with position one. The proper orientation of the slides in the adapter is as follows. The top of the adapter has the angled corners. Slide position one is closest to the angled corners. The target slide barcodes are positioned on the left side of the adapter. When all the slides are loaded, scan or enter the target slide barcodes in order beginning with position one. As the slides are scanned, the software displays a slide graphic of the sample spot positions. Verify the correct barcode displays. If a barcode is not recognized, make sure the slide information was sent from the prep station, send slide button. 
If an incorrect barcode is entered, click the Erase button and re-enter all barcodes starting with the slide in position 1. No acquisitions can begin until all slide barcodes are entered correctly. Load the slides into the instrument within five minutes of the door opening since the door closes automatically after five minutes. Gently slide the adapter into the carrier until you meet some resistance and it will go no further. As you slide your fingers across the back edge of the adapter, it should feel slightly concave. Note, the adapter can be put in backwards but will feel more convex. Testing will fail if the adapter is loaded incorrectly. At the acquisition station, click the start button. The adapter retracts and the vacuum system starts. The instrument should reach an operating pressure of approximately negative 6 millibars within 5 to 10 minutes of the door closing. The vacuum level can be monitored on the lower part of the screen as the source pressure bar changes from orange to green. If it takes more than 10 minutes to reach the operating pressure, the desiccant may need to be changed. The acquisition begins by testing the calibrator spot of the first acquisition group. If the calibrator passes, the patient samples in the acquisition group are tested. If a calibrator fails, no samples are tested in that acquisition group, and the instrument moves to the calibrator spot of the next acquisition group. When all samples in the group are tested, the calibrator is read one more time as an internal quality check. Results are sent to Milo when testing of an entire acquisition group is complete. During testing, the acquisition station target slide graphic displays various colors for each spot to indicate the status of each sample. Samples that fail can be reacquired at the end of the run by clicking on the spots and selecting Start. When the acquisition is complete, select the Open button and remove the target slides from the instrument. Slides that are completely used should be discarded according to your laboratory procedures. Slides with available acquisition groups can be stored at room temperature protected from dust and aerosols to be used at a later date. Summary. Log into Windows on the PC. Log into the Acquisition Station software. Click the Open button. Place the target slides in the adapter. Scan the target slide barcodes. Load the adapter with the slides into the instrument. Click the Start button. When testing is complete, Click the Open button and store or discard the slides according to your laboratory procedures. Meu nome é da Índio Mar Angélica, me estou trabalhando na ADC Corsol, é o laboratório mais especializado na Corsol, que está consistido de seis departamentos, onde há muito um analista no departamento de medicina e microbiologia. Um, na 2008, a ADC uh, cumpre o primeiro FITEC, o primeiro que se estava na rua, o qual se chama Apistrix, Antônio é que vou lhe dar para o lado assim manual. Deus promete para o pouco tempo para o bairro perder. Antônio depois que o vai ter que vir aí para começar a fazer uso de tempo para outro posto. Enquanto a DC a compra o vai ter por de por de bem melhores famílias. Anto tabat a sempre copi um, betroba, anto nunca no abai nenhum outro opção, é sempre a queda na Vitec. E Vitec aqui tem um sistema de vorden automatizar, anto bom o switch fácil também, for de e, e rechtlijnen na de CLSI ou UCAST. E vai ter também de biomilho, então biomilho é uma companhia um, reconhecida para o que aí acaba, então esse está a ser e vai ter o que confiável. When malaria claims one life every minute, it's time to change the way you test. 
Revolutionize your lab's diagnostic accuracy with the molecular performance of Illumigene Malaria. Delivers precise results in 40 minutes. Requires minimal training and expertise. Approximately two minutes of hands-on time. Add blood to buffer and mix. Transfer sample to sample preparation tube. Squeeze five to 10 drops of sample into a clean tube. Transfer prepared sample to test device. Insert Illumagene test device into Illumapro 10 and initiate amplification reaction. Illumagene delivers a clinical sensitivity of 100% and an analytical sensitivity as low as 0.125 parasites per microliter, which is up to 40,000 times more than conventional methods. Illumagene, for a future without malaria. I've known Farm Impact since the 90s, and Farm Impact has proven to be a company that is reliable and that uh, can offer best possible solutions for uh, laboratory issues and problems that we have been facing trying to give laboratory service on the island. And uh, I have to say the expertise and also the support has been one of the most valuable assets that uh, typifies Farm Impacts. What exceeded my expectations? Um, that Farm Impacts always is willing to go the extra mile and also even when there are no roads to find ways to make new roads. And that is one of the things that we found out uh, that, uh, or we found that, that uh, Farm Impacts is really flexible and uh, trying to help finding solutions. Um, I would tell somebody considering Farm Impacts that is a great company that you are able to um, get the best possible solution and that they are willing to work with you to get to uh, solving problems that you might say, that you might face. So that 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 is one of the aspects that uh, uh, typifies uh, farm impacts that they um, are really willing to support you, and it's not uh, and they are genuine. That that is one of the things that I like about farm impacts. They are really genuine.
Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to the third edition of the Caribbean Antimicrobial Stewardship Conference. We are so glad to have so many of you joining us from your offices, your labs, your hospitals, and whether you are connected by yourself or if you are following this seminar with other colleagues, thank you for investing this time in the fight against infectious disease. I want to thank the wonderful team of people who have worked and continue to work tirelessly behind the scenes to put this conference together in this new format. A special and heartfelt thank you goes out to all our speakers for their willingness to take the time to share and interact with us today on various topics. A sincere thank you goes out to our sponsors for it is in this collaboration between industry and the front lines that we are able to leverage resources towards common goals. Lastly, thank you for being an engaged and active participant today. The Caribbean Antimicrobial Stewardship Conference is hosted by Lab Knowledge and is made possible by contributions from various sponsors. Lab Knowledge is an institute for continuing education and research in laboratory science and is fully funded by Farmingpex. Four years ago, in a year-end debriefing following our travels throughout the Caribbean, I shared with my team the observation that there are a lot of good efforts going on in the Caribbean, specifically in the area of infectious diseases, antimicrobial stewardship, and infection prevention and control. But that unfortunately, there were not many avenues for this information to be exchanged among the countries and institutions of the Caribbean, and most importantly, between lab techs and medical practitioners themselves. I also noticed a real interest from all organizations to engage in continuing education and a commitment to fight infectious disease despite the lack of resources. These observations gave rise to the establishment of the Caribbean Antimicrobial Stewardship Platform, a lab knowledge initiative in which the focus was to create an avenue for sharing knowledge, practical experiences and best practices, Promote collaboration between islands, organizations, and individuals in the fight against infectious disease, and provide the infrastructure to link not only global, but especially our local Caribbean experts and make continuing education initiatives more accessible. In 2017, thanks to a funding guarantee by Farmingpex, Lab Knowledge committed to a five year cycle to host the Caribbean Antimicrobial Stewardship Conference. The first conference was held in Curaçao in September of 2018 in collaboration with NASCO, the Dutch Caribbean Foundation for Higher Clinical Education. In October of 2019, the conference was held in Barbados in collaboration with Dr. Corey Ford and his team from Caribbean Infection Prevention and Control. This year, the conference goes online and is spread over three consecutive monthly live webinars covering the topics of sepsis, infection prevention and control, and antimicrobial stewardship. Last year in Barbados, I was very much inspired by the breadth of medical professionals from all areas of healthcare who felt the importance to engage in infection prevention and control. It led me to declare in my opening statement that together, we can create a world in which there are no more deaths from infectious disease. While this may seem like a bold statement, and while it may be true that the results may not come overnight, this vision of our future is still worthwhile. In a year where we face the challenges of coronavirus, it may be easy to feel overwhelmed or feel like this problem is too big to solve. Still, there is a lot to celebrate. I want to remind each and every one of you that you are an important piece of the puzzle. As a healthcare practitioner, your choices directly impact the lives of people in your community. Most of these people don't know you, or most of these people may not comprehend the role you played in their health and well-being. You may not receive the recognition you feel you deserve. Despite all this, choose to make a positive impact and choose to make a difference in the fight against infectious disease. We may or may not be the generation that will eradicate death from infectious disease. But if we all do what is within our reach to contribute, we will be the generation who made significant progress on this issue so the next generation can get a head start. And that is certainly worth celebrating. Enjoy the conference and above all, share, interact, learn, and commit to the action that is within your reach to create a world in which there are no more deaths by infectious disease. Thank you.
Welcome, welcome all to the third Caribbean Antimicrobial Stewardship Conference. And this is hosted by Lab Knowledge Farm and Flex. This is the second mini series and it's on infection prevention and control. I am your moderator, Dr. Jose Davy, and I'm coming from the beautiful island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Congratulations to all of my fellow infection preventionists who celebrate this week, October every year, Infection Control Week. I regret not seeing you all in many colors in person, but thanks to Farming Flex, we still have this media to socially enjoy ourselves. It's social distance, but we are happy for the chance to chat. Yesterday, October 21st, marked 37 years that Mr. Rafael Diaz founded Farming Club. Over the years, hard work, dedication, and incredible foresight with wise decisions have propelled the company forward through good times and hardship. Mr. Diaz believes that education in general would enhance individual and personal satisfaction. Continual education in healthcare will enable healthcare professionals to stay current in evidence-based or evidence-informed practices to produce safe and quality patient care. Therefore, his children in 2013 gave him Lab Knowledge Foundation as a present to mark the 30th anniversary of Farm and Flex. Through our Lab Knowledge Foundation, we at Farm and Flex pursue our mission to contribute to quality health care, both at local as well as regional levels. In particular, facilitating educational sessions and research opportunities such as this one. Welcome again for those who are just joining. This is the third Caribbean Antimicrobial Stewardship Conference, second mini series with infection control in our topic. Remember to text your question at the chat option, and please, you need to stay to the end. There is a survey that you must fill complete at the end for your certificate of participation. Now, today's conference proves to be quite exciting. I've met our two speakers, and they have to deliver to us very delicious an informative presentation. So without any further ado, I am going to introduce to you our first speaker. Our first speaker is Mrs. Frances Estepe. She is a Caribbean woman by heart. She's from Puerto Rico, very hot island, but she lives and works in Cincinnati, Ohio. And this is where she did her biological science at the University of Cincinnati, Ohio. She has more than 35 years of experience in in vitro diagnostic at Meridian Bioscience. She's covering, she's covered from product research and development, manufacturing, quality assurance at the ASQC, certified quality auditor, She's in charge of international sales and marketing, and now her current position is marketing product manager. And today, she is going to tell us all about understanding SARS CoV 2 antigen test. I give you Mrs. Frances Estevez. Thank you very much, Dr. Day. I am um, going to share my screen. And um, so you tell, please tell me that you can see my screen. We can, you're good to go. Well, first of all, I wanna say thank you so very much for inviting me to be your presenter today. Uh, this is an honor. And I hope that everybody finds this information very useful. And um, if you have any questions, please um, put them on the chat and we will address them at the end of the presentation. And later on, we'll have some time also to answer some questions. So once again, thank you very much. And um, let's get started. Our topic for today is gonna to say, it's gonna be understanding SARS-CoV-2 
two antigen tests. Um, today's um, topic is more about what the laboratory can do and what they can look at when they're testing for COVID or COVID-19 or SARS. So SARS is a uh, an acronym for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome of Coronavirus 2. As we all know, the SARS belongs to um, <clears throat> the coronavirus uh, family and is a single-stranded RNA virus that also is very closely related to the alpha coronavirus and the beta coronavirus. Now, within that, there's a SARS-CoV-1 uh, that happened in 2002. And as you can see, um, it is very, uh, in the bottom of the slide, they can see that the genome are very similar. So there are certain concerns at times that you could have um, certain levels of maybe cross-reactivity with some of these strains that are similar in their genetic composition. And <clears throat> what happens is that, um, it brings to relay the um, concern with sometimes having cross reactivity, and hence the reason that many of the tests that are now out there will do a lot of testing that is related to some of these strains that is very similar, and to prove that the tests that we're using are not giving you a cross reactive um, result or a false positive result for that matter. So many of the strains that you see in many of the tests that are available today will use these strains to do the um, cross-reactivity testing and measure the specificity of the test, like the 229E and the NL63 strains, as well as the OC43 and the HKU1 strains, as well as the MERS uh, strain that was popular in 2012. And of course, the SARS a strain one, if you want to call it that, that was available uh, around 2002. So let's look closer at the, at the structure of the SARS or the coronavirus, um, the way it is structured. It's going to be composed of what's called spike proteins. There's a S1 and S2. There's an envelope protein, there's a membrane glycoprotein, there's some RNA sequence, <clears throat> and there's a nucleocapsid protein. The spike one, uh, excuse me, X, spike S1 protein binds to what is called the ACE2 protein. And I'll talk more there in a second. And it's, it's essential for interaction with the host cells. The nucleocapsid protein, which is the nucleocapsid protein is an important antigen which participates in RNA binding and virus particle release. The nucleocapsid protein has emerged as a better target for diagnostic antigen tests because it's more conserved and it's more abundant and therefore making it easy to detect when you're running a test for antigen detection. Now the AC2 receptor, which is the an angiotensin converting enzyme 2. It's <clears throat> a host cell receptor responsible for mediating infection. It's considered the entry point for the coronavirus. It's a protein in the surface of many cell types, like in the lungs. It's present in the kidneys, liver, gastro tract, the upper airways, uh, even in the eyes. So hence making the coronavirus attachment to your cells uh, kind of easy in a way because it's present in so many uh, areas of your body. But as we all know, the lungs is one of the primary um, sites and hence the respiratory virus, you swallow it, it's in your tracts and first place where it can land is in the lungs and there's plenty of AC2 receptors in there. So it attaches very uh, prominently, very easily. So, the infection rate and the symptoms are related to, you know, how severe and how uh, critical and, and or not the infection can be. And what we have seen, and this is data that have been offered by different studies, but is that 80% of the cases are going to be uh, on a mild to moderate uh, types. But of that, 10 to 15% are going to progress to a severe case. And then of that, about 15 to 20% will progress to a critical uh, stage. In, in general, 
about 80% are going to be moderate, about 15% are going to be three severe cases, and about 5% are going to be critical cases. So this is where the issue comes. It's because so many of or higher percentage of uh, patients are infected are going to have either mild cases or even sometimes being totally asymptomatic. This is where the challenge comes with um, identifying people who are infected and potentially um, cr uh, uh, passing the infection on to other people without even knowing that they have infection. So uh, this is important because viral shedding happens, um, is the highest in the early stage of the infection when you have like one to two days into having symptoms. And one week to 12 days in the mild cases and then more than two weeks in severe cases. So it is important uh, also for when they're doing trying to diagnose a patient, how many days has been since the symptoms have occurred or since the symptoms appeared? Because that will have a very important understanding of where they are in the, in the face of the disease. Now, a lot of the symptoms and the most common symptoms and that have been identified with COVID infection are uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath. These are like the three main most popular well-known um, symptoms that will show up when you have COVID infection. Now beyond this there's tons of other symptoms like losing your sense of taste and smell, um, having chills, um, so many other things but for some reason fever, cough and shortness of breath um, are really key, key indicators of the coronavirus infection. Now, I wanted to review a bit about basic testing for coronavirus. First of all, there are molecular tests, there's antibody tests, and there are antigen tests. How the sample is collected? For molecular tests, a an, nasopharyngeal an swab or a nasal swab in transport media is usually what's um, used. For antibody tests, of course, you're going to have a finger stick or a blood drawn. And then for antigen tests, the most commonly recommended sample is a nasopharyngeal swab. How long it takes to get results? Well, a molecular test can take between one to three days, depending on how the, the laboratory is set up and how quickly can they process the samples. An antibody test usually is going to be the same day because it only takes about 15 minutes to get results. And same goes for an antigen test. Nowadays, an antigen test will take about 15 minutes uh, to get results. So you should be able to get your results same day. In, is another test needed? Well, that's a big question that a lot of times you hear. And when it comes to molecular tests, this test is typically highly accurate and usually does not need to be repeated. In the case of an antibody test, sometimes a second antibody test is needed for accurate result, results or reflex to a molecular test to confirm. So sometimes you may have a result from an antibody test that is not quite uh, determining that you have, but you still have symptoms. And so it could be that it's too early in the disease and the antibodies have not been produced yet. So um, many cases they will reflex to a molecular test to confirm if, if the symptoms are for COVID or not. And the antigen test, positive results are usually highly accurate, but negative results may be needed to be confirmed with a molecular test, especially in symptomatic patients. And the reason here is that it is known that many times the rapid antigen test may be less sensitive than a molecular test. So if you have a negative test, but the symptoms are there and you're still concerned, then they should be uh, reflexed into a molecular test. What is what it shows. So a molecular test shows that diagnosis of active coronavirus infection, where the antibody test shows that you have been infected recently, if you have IgM antibodies, or if it was a past infection because you now have IgG antibodies. So this is very telling on where, what stage of the infection or the disease you are. And the antigen test diagnosis the active infection. It is in, and it's an active infection that where you have the infection uh, at, as of today, as of right now. 
I think cannot do. Well, the molecular test cannot show if you ever had a COVID infection previously and were infected with coronavirus in the past because molecular test is also going to detect the presence of the antigen in the, at the time of, of testing. So if you were infected previously, this the molecular test will not show that. The antibody test diagnose active infection at the time of the test or show that you do not have COVID. Um, and it cannot show an active infection. Again, you're measuring antibodies, meaning that you already responded to an infection. And it could have already been gone by the time the antibody test comes out positive, especially if it's IgG. And the antigen test completely rule out active cannot completely rule out an active infection. Again, <clears throat> reason being of uh, may have um, a missed positive. So that's uh, another reason why you, if you suspect uh, of an infection, it should be tested or, or followed up by a molecular test. <clears throat> so if we look at the immune response and testing and when testing should be done, um, if we look at the mustard color yellow uh, section here, that shows you mostly when the PCR tests are most effective. And as you can see, antigens are going to show up early into the infection. In some cases, uh, you're going to be shedding even before you have symptoms. But the PCR test is best at, at early in the infection, and then it will drop um, pretty quickly about day, between day 10, 15 or so. Now, the antigen test, which is your purple, um, it was said that you would probably have the most shedding between five and 10, 14 days. But in most recent times, it's shown that you do have the most shedding about day one, two after symptoms occur. And they tend to drop kind of at between day five and day seven. So that's why um, testing for antigen is highly recommended that it do, that is done uh, promptly anti after symptoms occur to get the best results. So if we look at how best use your testing is either molecular versus antigen. It is understood that a molecular test typically found more traditional laboratory in a core lab. Other tests being run at these same platforms, you have bigger platforms and you run multiple tests on those big platforms. Therefore, your turnaround time could be a little uh, longer and your molecular test is gonna be a much higher labor uh, because it does take more time and more hands-on time to run the test. But you can accommodate a higher volume of testing. Where when you have a, an antigen test, you are going to be more um, able to run it outside of the traditional lab. You're gonna be able to take it closer to the patient in a way and it's easy of use and a lower cost than the molecular test can provide, help provide results in, in short time and fast decisions for isolation and treatment and active infectious status. So if you have a result from an antigen test that can tell you that that patient is positive within 15 minutes, that can certainly allow the physician to be able to either start treatment or start isolation or ask you know, start contact tracing, whatever is needed, uh, especially in a very quick, short, uh, short amount of time. So why an antigen test? And many occasions, if you have a PCR, why an antigen test? Well, one of the main advantages of an antigen test is the speed of the test, which can provide results in minutes. And antigen tests are close are also important in the overall response against COVID-19 as they can generally be produced at a lower cost than a PCR test. This was a statement made by the FDA uh, in regards to the availability of antigen tests. So let's look a bit about the utility of the antigen test. And in this case, we're looking at the utility of the test based on a guidance that the World Health Organization posted early in September. And in their view, 
Ease of use and rapid turnaround time offers potential for extended access to testing and decreased delay in diagnosis by shifting to decentralized testing of patients with early symptoms. Again, they see the utility of an antigen test because it's of ease of use and how quickly can you get results and how quickly you can implement actions toward that patient. Offer opportunity for early diagnosis and interruption of transmission through targeted isolation. Patients with five to seven days after symptoms are more likely to have lower viral load and higher likelihood of false negative result. That is something that we have to keep in mind when we use an antigen test, that we will have the challenge of understanding where in the disease of course is that patient. And then general recommendations from the WHO is that a, an antigen test should have a performance of greater than 80% sensitivity and greater than 97% specificity, especially compared to a PCR test or a NAT test. With that said, the appropriate scenario for use of a rapid antigen test are defined by the WHO, WHO as follows. Respond to suspected outbreak in remote settings or institutions or semi-closed communities to support outbreak investigations and could be used to screen at-risk individuals and in rapidly isolate positive cases. To monitor trends in disease incidents in communities to enable effective infection control. In widespread community transmissions of the rapid antigen testing may be used for early detection and isolation of positive cases. And testing of asymptomatic contact cases may be considered, even though the antigen test is not specifically authorized for this use, since asymptomatic cases have been demonstrated to have viral loads similar to symptomatic cases. So as if you noticed in every occasion here, the recommendation is to be able to test, to get a quick result, so that that can, patient can be either isolated or treated appropriately. So with that, um, I would like to look at what is the COVID-19 positivity rate in the world. And as you can see, this um, data was on the left-hand side was pulled in September, 20, September 28th of 2020, about three weeks ago, and um, the light blue color is the lower infection rates, and the red or the deeper red are going to be the higher infection rate areas. And three weeks later, on the right-hand side of, this, of the uh, screen, the, um, this is the data that was pulled on October 19th, so just a few days ago. And as you can see, um, there's still a very high number of countries that have um, red, so they're in a high, high incidence rate. And um, some of the areas in countries like Canada, for example, that was in a lower rate is moving to a higher rate of uh, disease. And it's um, in the area like in Russia and like in the European countries, some of those are going from blue to orange or to red. So. There is a big concern in terms of the how the positivity rate is um, going and, and how this disease is being put under control and lack of <laughs> thereof, if, if that's the case. Um, and how testing is being performed. And unfortunately, if you look at this world map, it is all over the place. It's, it's It varies from one end to the other and so some areas where the high incidence is the testing is not as much and some other areas where they do have high incidence they seem to be doing more testing but unfortunately it's really there's no pattern there's no it's very random how all the testing is being performed so let's talk about the concerns with antigen test in general and as i said before uh, one of the concerns is that the antigen test uh, will have a slightly less accuracy than a molecular test and that's always been um, a factor of just the technology uh, itself 
But a, a positive antigen test result is considered very accurate, but there's an increased chance of false negative results. And from that, I would like to look at really how that impacts our ability to detect uh, patients if you have an antigen test. So uh, from the British Medical Journal, they have this um, interactive view of how well a test can perform. And what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare two different tests that are out in the market and show how they behave depending on the incidence rate. So in an incidence rate of a 30%, which is considered kind of high, gen body antigen test, which is the Meridian test, compared to another antigen test with a slightly higher sensitivity. So the gen body test has a sensitivity of 87% and a specificity of 100%. Let's see how it compares to an antigen test that has 93% sensitivity and a specificity of 99%. Overall, what you find if in 100 patients and you do testing on 100 patients, you're going to find that the some, the test with the 87% sensitivity will have four false negative results, where the test with the 93% sensitivity is going to have only two false negative results. On the other hand, the test that has 100% specificity, we have zero false positives, which is also a concern, and the test with the 99 will have one false positive. Now, so in general and high incidence, you're going to have that um, this, the gem body test will have uh, two more false negatives than the other test. Now, if the scenario changes where the incidence rate is 10%, which is more in the general vicinity of what the incidence rates are, then in this case, the 87% sensitive uh, test, which is the gem body, right? And then versus a 93% sensitive test, at that point, they're both going to have one false negative. So infection rate has a, an impact on how you, your test and your test that you choose is going to behave. So in this case, they're both going to have one false negative. And the um, gen body product that has a specificity of 100 will not have any false positive results where the other test will have one positive, positive result. In general, we can say that, as in summary, a low at a low incidence, an, an 87% sensitive test will perform pretty much equal to a 93% sensitive test. So in conclusion, we have to say that likelihood of a false result is dependent on incidence of disease. The rapid antigen test performs better in lower sense incidence of population as it will have less false negative results, as we just shown. A lower incidence, at a lower incidence, there is practically no difference in performance between tests with sensitivities of 87% and 93%. And false negative results can also depend on where you are in the course of the disease. Is it less or more or less than five or seven days? So, Let's also look at other side of the performance of the test. What is a positive percent agreement and what is positive predictive value and what do they mean and why they are important? So if we look at positive percent agreement, that is the same thing as sensitivity. It tells how well the tests compare in identifying a positive when the disease is presented versus a gold standard. In, in this case, the gold standards has been used uh, that have been used is a PCR test. Negative percent agreement is a specificity. Tells how well the test compares in identifying negatives when the disease is not present versus a gold standard. Now, a positive predictive value measures the probability that the disease is present when the test is positive. Positive predictive value is impacted by the specificity of the test. Therefore, a test with a high sensitivity but low specificity will have a poor or low positive predictive value, meaning that the probability of detecting a true positive may be lower than looking at sensitivity alone. 
Now, negative predictive value measures the probability that the disease is not present when the test is negative. And I want to give you an example of what that looks like. If the positive predictive value, we look at a gen body data performance, the positive percent agreement is 86.54%. The negative percent agreement is 100%. That means that the calculated positive predictive value is 100%, which means that you have a high probability that the test will detect the positives that are in that um, group of patients that are going to be tested. The negative predictive value is, uh, excuse me, the negative percent agreement is 96. Now, if that data would change, and let's say that it would have had nine false positives, let's say, and so the true negatives drops to 160 instead of 169. Then the recalculated positive percent agreement is 86.54. So that doesn't change because we, it didn't impact uh, sensitivity. But the negative percent agreement will drop from 100 to 94.67. But look what happens to your positive percent agreement. The positive percent, excuse me, the positive predictive value will drop from 100% to 83.3%. And the negative percent, uh, excuse me, the negative predictive value will be, drop a little bit from 96 to 95.8. What this is showing is that Sensitivity is important, but specificity is important because then the probability of you detecting the right test or the right patient will be impacted by your specificity and your test and the ability and the probability of detecting a positive. So with that, I would like to go over what the GenBody product uh, does and what it is. And the GenBody COVID-19 antigen test is for the detection COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. Uh, GenBody a test is a lateral flow immunoassay intended for the qualitative detection of nucleocapsid antigen from the SARS-CoV-2 in nasopharyngeal swabs in 15 minutes from individuals who are suspect of being infected with COVID-19 by their healthcare providers. And this test is for 25 tests, and it includes your devices and your swabs, and um, it's all in one in the kit to all together. And this kit can be stored at two to 30 degrees centigrade. Now the procedure is very straightforward, very simple. You have a tube that you're going to add your buffer up to the line, so about 400 microliters. From there, you take your nasopharyngeal swab and you swirl it in that buffer and you kind of turn it around, then remove the swab, add your dropper cap, and just add four drops into the cassette. Once you add the four drops into the cassette, you wait 15 minutes and then you can read the results. So. Again, it's a nasopharyngeal swab. This is to be used directly from a nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, it does not allow for use of transport media. When you read the results, um, this is going to have an internal uh, control. So you can have control line, and then you're going to have your test line. And you will have a pink color band if it's positive, and you will have um, just one control band if it's negative. Um, labs can do their own QC by using known positive and known negatives for this test. So the data, uh, as you can see, uh, this was tested against a, a PCR test that was developed by the CDC. So we compared to a PCR from the CDC. And it has um, a total of 221 samples. There were 52 positives and 169 negatives. We detected 86.54% percent uh, percent agreement, and the negative percent agreement is 100%. The positive predictive value is 100%, and the negative predictive value is 96%. So this, and if you can see, it also meets the criteria that the WHO uh, established for uh, expected performance of a rapid test. Now, um, you know, let's look at the factors affecting the laboratories when it comes to testing. There's a, a sense of fear uh, to a certain extent because we are facing a possible 
what they call a twin demic, where a uh, flu season is coming and they have all these people who have COVID and they can be both happening at the same time. And so this is a concern to the laboratories because there are issues um, on how to handle such a volume of testing, you know, and, and do I have to do other tests and do I have to test for flu at RSV or is it mycoplasma, is it Legionella? I mean, these are all potential respiratory diseases, even group A strep or pertussis for that matter. So it is a very concerning and very, uh, a, a real fear for the laboratories. Also creates anxiety because there's a critical need for differentiate, di differentiate diagnosis with respiratory system symptoms. Uh, so what do I do? How do I test? What test do I use? It is always um, uh, something that creates anxiety for the lab. And last but not least is the uncertainty. Uh, is there real factors or supply issues for the COVID testing and also for other tests? Is am I going to have enough tests to run? Am I going to have enough supplies? Am I going to have enough swabs? Am I going to have enough uh, flu test. It, that's always an uncertainty and it's always affects uh, how the laboratory operates and how the laboratory goes about doing their testing. So if we look at these laboratories, new test options, growing testing burden, laboratory personnel is an issue, supply versus demand, value price products, variability, quantity of uh, testing, increased price pressure, supply, time to deliveries. We look at all these demands that the laboratory have, we could say product choices is always a concern. So is, it, is there an instrument needed? Yes, no. Uh, it, do I do molecular or I do anti or do I do both? That's all. It, it's something that the laboratory has to take in consideration. Is a fair value price? You know, we have to take, you know, our budget, but at the same time, some you have to take into account that cheaper is not always better. Uh, sometimes it pays to pay a little more for a test if you know that you have confidence in the results that you're going to get. So that's uh, f something that laboratories have to, to factor in. And the availability of product and supply, potential de deciding factor. Um, it's, it's, is it a reputable source? Is it a reliable vendor? It's, is that something that I can trust uh, for the future? Uh, am I going to have consistent supply? Can I trust them to get me the products and the amount of products that I need and I want? And those are things that the laboratory has to deal with when making these decisions and bringing these tests into their labs and um, moving forward and looking into what's going to be coming next. So with that, and in summary, I wanted to review that antigen testing can provide fast, actionable results, and it gives you a potential for isolation and treatment if necessary. Incidence and timing of testing during the disease course impact antigen results. Positive predictive value is important because it measures the probability of disease and how many how your positives are going to be positive. And antigen testing has a place within the diagnostic world of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And it's just a matter of how and where this place is within your lab and within your patient population. So at Meridian, our goal is to simplify healthcare and provide the lives of patients and healthcare professionals worldwide. And thank you very much for your attention. And um, please let me know if you have any questions. We would like to thank Mrs. Frances Estevez for such an interesting presentation. If you, there are a few questions brewing in the chat already, but at this time, if you look up the right side of your screen, there is a section called polls. We would like for you to just go ahead and answer those questions and make your vote. And we would have a quick moment to ask Mrs. Estevez a few questions but the majority of the questions we would leave for the end, the end of um, Mr. Ponce's presentation when we are wrapping up. So go ahead now and take those polls with me. Mrs. Estevez, while the participants, the attendees are taking the question, I see in the chat brewing a little discussion. So Rohan is saying that with all of the availabilities, why don't we ask? the patients to take all of the available tests to eliminate a false negative. 
And then another participant said to him, what would be the value of how would a molecular test complement an antibody test? So this is something that you quickly want to address while you're taking the polls. Yes. Um, the, um, the challenge that I see um, with at home uh, testing, which was what you were, they were asking, right, um, is that the quality of the sample that is taken comes to play a role on the outcome of the results. And so if the, if the sample is not taken properly, then there's a chance that the outcome of the result is not the best or, or, or what uh, optimal as it can be. And also interpretation of results, sometimes you need um, somebody in a laboratory to do that kind of interpretation because that can be play a role on the results and how the outcome of the results are. So having a laboratory and uh, be the one managing the testing for this type of test, I believe that if the test was taken a little or the testing was performed later in the infection and the antigen is already disappeared or has gone to lower levels that are not detectable, the antibody test will be positive, but the antigen test will be negative. So if you lead with have an antigen test or a molecular test, which measures antigen presence, right? Uh, and that comes out to be a, ne a negative test, but there are symptoms there. Then following up with a serology test to see if antibodies were present, then will give you the information that that patient at some point had, had been infected and it did have the disease. I hope that answers your question. Yes, I, I hope they're satisfied with, with that answer. So we would leave the others for the end when we can have a nice big discussion. But at this time, we are going to go on to our second presenter. And he is none other than Cesar Ponce. And I said it in Spanish. And he's a clinical microbiology advisor. Mr. Ponce studied epidemiology at the Universidad de Cooperativa de Colombia. He also studied microbiology and parasitology at the Universidad Pontificada Boliviana, and that's in Colombia. His work experiences include public health and Curiso. He's the public health advisor in Curiso. He's the clinical microbiological advisor. He's the head of department of medical microbiology at the Analytic Diagnostic Center. He's also infection control advisor at the Atelian Advent Hospital. He's infectologist, epidemiologist at the foundation of the Cardiovascular Institute. He also is at the Diagnostic Lab and Blood Bank in Colombia. This man apparently never sleep. So today, he is going to tell us all about infection prevention challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic for Small Island. And this chat, I'm very interested to listen to, and I know that you would also enjoy. Mr. Ponce. Thank you, Doctor. My special, I want to say a special thanks to Mrs. Emily, and of course, of all the sponsors of, of this conference, online conference. In this moment, I want to start my, my presentation immediately about the COVID prevention. And then we need to, to we will talk about three topics initially is a prevention from a traditional view, challenge of the small islands, and holistic view that we have in, in this new concept, or maybe this is not a new concept, but maybe it was forget for many uh, governments or for other public health uh, physicians. We need to know what are the public 
basic principles, the disease controlled by prevention. It divided is in, in three steps. Primary prevention is to avoid to get the disease to secondary means early diagnosis and an early treatment. And the tertiary, preve tertiary prevention is disease and disability recovery. For today, we will talk about the first two uh, prevention topics, primary and secondary prevention. For primary prevention, we need For primary prevention, we can get the goals in two ways. One of them is uh, for the vaccines, but you know that in this moment we don't, don't have any vaccine available in this moment. For, and then we need to talk about the other ways for, for to, uh, to, get open, uh, to get the infection by the coronavirus. And the secondary prevention is early diagnosis and early treatment, and then we need to talk about the test. Test for the in this moment, as our predecessor, is antigen detection or biomolecular diagnosis in this moment. For the tertiary, is not the topic for prevention because it's more for clinic specialties of the medical facilities. And then this is the bigger problem of the COVID-19. Many people are looking for incidents. We have many cases, many positive cases. Incidents rate, positive, positive rate. Uh, the other, it's the economical impact in all the countries, or all the islands, but is more, more important for me, the deficit healthcare system, and of course, the mortality. For prevention, then we need to know who is the enemy, how is its attack, how is its transport, and then how we can protect against the virus, how to destroy the virus and how is the transmission prevention for to contain the pandemic. This is the enemy in this moment. It is important that the virus, the coronavirus or COVID-19, this is COVID-19, has a As a lipid membrane in it, in the world of the, of the virus as a, a lipid membrane. And what why this is important that the virus because the first uh, condition to destroy the virus is to cleaning. Usually all the, the World Health Organization, CDC, PAHO or others public health agencies to use the soaps and work more than others. If you can use always soap and water, this is as effective or better than common chemical sanitizer like alcohol or bleach. But of course, you cannot use the an all time the soap and, and water and then you can use the alcohol or chemical sanitizer. The rich has a cell made of lipids and then soap destroyed by agitating. When you are screwing your hands or are washing machine agitating, creates, creates mechanical force on the molecule and open the COVID lipid cell which destroys the virus. And then this is very important. That means that everybody has the possibility to destroy the virus in every setting that you are. 
what is the way for uh, the virus attack? Principally, remember, this is a respiratory virus and then attack the respiratory system but by the receptors, the ACE2, but by is the, the transport, the vital transport, principally by droplets and principally secondary by aerosol. In this moment, we know that the World Organization recognized the transmission by aerosol. And then this is a, a new topic for the during the pandemic. Of course, we need prevention to avoid that the virus get to the receptors. And then we need to use or to wear masks. Masks are uh, 95 and 95 or chirurgic mask or non-medical mask. We have face shields. And in this, in this moment, we need to know what are the uh, efficiency of the, of the mask. And please, we can do the, the first question for interaction with the Hello? We can do the first question with interaction. So attendees, you can take the poll. Okay, the poll. You can go ahead and take the poll. Okay. This is the, the first question. Yes, they're answering. How effective okay. are face masks in reducing the newly registered SARS COVID infection? They're answering. Yes, the first is 68% is it between 15 and 75%. This is correct in this one. And this is the, the, the argument why this is effective between 15 and 25%. This country with cultural norms or government policies supporting public mask, mask wearing and most lower per capita mortality rate. You know, that's always we are looking for. And face masks reduce the, reduce the number of new registered SARS-CoV-2 infection by between 15 and 75% over day, over, over a 20 day period after the mandatory introduction. But what is the effectivity of the, of the mask? Uncovered coats can travel up to three meters. And then if we accept now that a, a transmission can be by aerosol, and then that means that the, the travel, the coast, the uncovered travel more than three meters. And then a simple disposable mask reduce the distances to 0 0.5 meters. And this is the, the reason that uh, actual recommendation is in, in public uh, space use the cloth mask in not a surgical mask, but always maintain the uh, social distancing. And the uh, N95 mask limited the spread to use 0, 0 0.5 meters. Uh, the filtration effectiveness, fit and performance of cloth masks are inferior to those of medical masks and respirators. Then, cloth masks use should not be mandated for healthcare workers. And then the recommendation is if the community can use the surgical mask, it's possible, but if you don't have to recall mask, and then you can use the closed mask. And the closed mask should be washed daily and after high exposure used by using soap and water or other appropriate methods. And always we have a, a discussion with the, between the colleagues, the clinical microbiologists, epidemiologists, and in, in, in the EU, 
the discussion agree, but the face mask is effective. But independent of this discussion, the RIVM, this is the National Health Institute from the Netherlands, recommends use Dutch face masks in, uh, in public spaces. Not necessary in private life. In use of non-medical face mask is required when you travel by public transport. This star, this uh, guideline star more than two months in this year. And this is important. Face mask when say goodbye at home in the event of uh, a death, we need to use medical face mask because the risk is bigger than uh, in public spaces but it's not necessary to use or to wear gloves in the public areas. And then we can do the, the second question. Also, yes. Can asymptomatic or presymptomatic COVID patient transmit the infection? Initially, we had a big discussion about this asymptomatic patient or non-symptomatic or presymptomatic patient can transmit the infection. Initially, the, the concept for some colleagues is that if the, the patient Presymptomatic or no symptomatic doesn't have a high viral load and that is not to transmit the infection. But other studies in, in, in around the world show that the asymptomatic patient has high viral load and the same the same level of the infection. And then, this is very important topic for uh, to do the prevention. Ventilation system provide clean air by exchanging indoor outdoor air and filtering. And uh, air conditioner system usually recirculate the air without missing it with outdoor air. And, uh, the question in this moment, it is true that all our ventilation system provide clean air by indoor and outdoor air and filtering? I don't know, but I think that is not true in all the uh, hospital in, in the Caribbean or in the world, not only in the Caribbean, but in the world. And then this increase the risk Again, if we accept the new concept of World Health Organization, WSO, that the transmission can be by aerosol, and then this is a new risk for the uh, closed areas of closed space. Poor ventilation is confined in indoor spaces associated with increased transmission of respiratory infection. There have been numerous COVID-19 transmission even associated with closed spaces, including some from presymptomatic cases. And we know different reports in the world from United States of America or for Europe that principally in some hospitals where uh, they detected outbreak of COVID-19, it was associated with air conditioning system. Now, the second topic is challenges of small islands. Okay, this is the, the first challenge. Availability, 
of the different materials that we need to control the, the disease or the control the epidemic or the pandemic. Personal protective equipment is this. And then I can change the, the term availability. I, I is we have availability or we have shortage of these materials. I think that is more true that we have shortage of all of this material. Principal and uh, personal protective equipment. Remember that personal protective equipment, principally the face mask or N95 or chulical mice, the recommendation, the global recommendation is reserve this personal protective equipment to uh, hospital settings and not for community. But on the other hand, recommend that if you can use in the community surgical mask, you should mask. And the other situation is the possible, this possible close for healthcare workers. I know uh, about hand sanitizer, remember that in initially in the pandemic state, we detected a shortage of hand sanitizer in different uh, countries, different islands, and then including the supermarkets, limited when you are buying the hand sanitizer, only permit by one or two bottles of hand sanitizer by client. And uh, what about the diagnosis kit and equipment? And this is important for us. The diagnosis kit, remember, we have different situations. For example, the a rapid diagnostic kit by PCR, this is that get the results in about 15 minutes. minutes. The, this was uh, by the producer or by the country that produced this uh, rapid and PCR test limited to the United States. It's not possible to export this diagnosis technique. And then for the other, the other part, what about the, the PCR? All the small island have the capacity to buy or to management about the special test like a PCR. And then, and then we have now the alternative that it is easily to perform this test or for interpretation, what is the antigen detection. And about the antibody detection is, is important know how we can the infection or how is the prevalence in the general community but in this moment it's not it's, you have a, a lot of the, the, the test uh, the test for infection, but in this moment no, it's not important to control the infection remember that we want to detect positive patient, patients and antibody detection can inform you that the patient was in contact with the, the virus, but usually they don't have active in looking for the first two tests for PCR or anti detection. Later, for public health studies or public health knowledge, we can do the zero survey by uh, antibody detection. This, this is the other uh, topic, uh, the availability, the principally the staff. What about clinical staff? To management, uh, pandemic management, we need a lot of staff, specialists, clinical, infectiologists, intensive care, uh, a, a lot of, of not only the, the medical staff, you know, nurse staff. And about public health, we need a specific persons that for 
management of the pandemic, epidemiologists, statistics, public health specialists, specialists in social communication, because this is a very important topic for the communicate to the uh, to the society or to the community. We need social workers and to do the diagnosis. Remember, in the first week, I said, we need early diagnosis to con epidemic. And then we need the laboratory diagnosis. And then that means that we need to be specialized in the laboratory to do the, the, labor, the diagnosis. Um, what about healthcare settings? We have enough beds for pandemic attention. When if the global statistics say that 15% of the uh, positive patients may need uh, hospital attention, and then we have enough beds for patient attention. I was remember one of my visit to one small island with the Dutch this is Seva and Stasia, and usually they have no more than five, five beds for in every island of maximal, maximum for patient attention. And then you have a lot of spacing, and then you need to do a transfer patient transportation to other islands or to uh, high level uh, attention, hospital high level attention. And then it's not possible to have every island have intensive care unit for to do the attention. Uh, other topics is important, infection prevention and control program, because remember in the uh, initial uh, time of the pandemic, many patients were detected in, for example, retirement houses or nursery houses because some or many of, of them doesn't have a infection prevention control program or have an infection prevention control program. And then in the case of the Dutch Caribbean, the, Hello? Hello. Okay. I'm here again. Great. Continue. I lost my internet connection for and then and then that means that we need more activities to uh, a process we need if we are to protect, if we want to protect our the health, not only the point of view of infectious disease. We need to view the point of view, point of view, or a, a non communicable diseases in this moment. And then, what about the, the new actions? We need to work together. I have seeing in this pandemic that usually the medical team for epidemiology team work without the community, work only with the, with the government and produce regulation and inform the community you need to do this and this and this. But those are not working with all the stakeholders to that can help to control the pandemic and principally don't work with the community. The, one, the, the reality that we in this moment is the community aging and the community aging means that non-communicable diseases are increasing, the immunodeficiencies and other infectious diseases. Yeah. It's the same situation, but you want to change the social behavior, 
you need to work with the community or other important stakeholders. About the engineering, we need to rethink about the construction of the building of new hospital models. We need to be prepared for new pandemics, not only the this uh, COVID pandemic. Since 2012, after the uh, medium East uh, coronavirus disease or MERS, the public health agencies of all the world are announcing that we need to prepare with other pandemics or epidemics. But that was not the reality. And then we need to improve and implement infection prevention control. Remember, there are different, different countries that the uh, uh, healthcare workers have a, a high incidence or high for the coronavirus disease. For example, in Mexico, they informed that 19% of the all cases of the uh, COVID-19 are healthcare workers. And this is very important, not only water waste management, but all waste management. This is included in infection prevention control. In different countries, for example, the Netherlands, United States of America, uh, and Germany, they are detecting the coronavirus uh, in the waste wastewater. It's a point to control if you are doing the screening in the community. Um, say, in a you can detect where is the circulation of the, the COVID. And very, very important is the staff capacity for pandemic management. And we need to prepare the staff, the public health staff for pandemic management. Not only epidemiologists, we need all the specialities for the communication or other management for the pandemic management. And then we need to, to have the open mind or other vision or holistic vision. And finally, the concept of public health is the science of protecting and improving the health of people and their communities. This work is achieved by promoting healthy lifestyles, researching disease and prevention, and detecting, preventing, and responding to infectious disease. Thank you. Thank you for permitting me to show my, my thinking and uh, maybe a new vision, or not new vision, but we need to rethink to implement with holistic vision to control the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fonse. We thank both presenters. And I see we have a very shy audience because there are not many questions in the chat box. But please remember that you can leave them there. Uh, while you're doing that, I would like to ask some of my own questions. <laughs> so for Francis, yes. over there in Ohio, does the WHO accept an antigen test as confirmation for COVID-19? Oh, well, um, right now the guidance is for in a way, the guidance is to allow uh, more testing to happen because the biggest concern is that the limit there's a limitation on the amount of tests that has been performed, and where it's been performed and how it's been performed. So by them endorsing the use of an antigen test, it's just giving them an opportunity to be able to decentralize in a way the testing and be able to get more testing done um, than just relying on just strictly uh, PCR test because that's more limited. So the intent here is to 
uh, widened, if you will, the opportunity to do more testing than, than anything. Yes. So this is Infection Prevention Control Week. And I know a lot of personnel, be it those who sample the, the clients and the lab personnel, there's still a bit of fear about performing testing. So can you tell the attendees about the relative risk, especially for the lab personnel? What risk is there handling, manipulating a sample that can possibly be COVID-19 positive? Is it me or Dr. Ponce? And you? Oh, me, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, um, like any laboratory, and you know, definitely you have to keep follow laboratory good practices, you know, and uh, absolutely um, you wear your masks and your gloves and your shields if that's uh, how the lab is being set up. Um, any sample should be treated as a biohazard. And so, therefore, I would believe that if you do follow those requirements and those, you know, recommendations, that you should be okay. Um, but it's when we get a little bit of uh, a little lax and not follow the procedures as stated that you can be at risk. But if you do follow the good manufacturing practices for the laboratory, um, you should be okay. Yes, I just wanted for them to hear that it's okay and there's no reason for fear because no. I've seen it here where persons, when they hear that a sample is coming and it's for COVID-19 tests, there is a little fear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, once a sample is um, processed, the, the chances of being contagious, you know, diminishes. Yeah. But... But don't be fooled. I mean, you still try have to treat it as a biohazard. <laughs> I mean, don't you can assume that it's now non-infectious. You always have to treat any sample, regardless, as if it was an infectious agent. Um, but in truth, um, once it's in the buffer and it's being processed, that it kind of goes down. I mean, the, the the level of infectivity could be definitely reduced. But you still have to follow all the requirements and all the recommendations for the lab. Yes, that is very important because the person may not be COVID-19 positive, but they may be carrying something else that is, a, you know, more hazardous. Exactly. More hazardous. Yeah. Um, for Senior Ponce, someone yes. in, they're speaking about the holistic view, the holistic view of managing in a, in a small island and the challenges that, that are presented. Do you see any of this impact, be it economical impact? How did it really play out in Colombia? Yes, in, in Colombia, we have a very bad economical impact, very high economical impact because many companies closed. And this is the same situation, the, the follow line, the stay at home. And, uh, in Colombia, principally, we have a lot of uh, informal economy. And then if you need to work to get the payment. If you don't work, you don't get the payment. Yeah. And then this contributes to the dissemination of the, of the pandemic. Because against the guidelines, the people need to go to the street, you know, mm -hmm. outside the home. Because if they don't work, the family it will be with hungry, with with, with a, a disnutrition. Or in this moment, a, a social analysis from the Latin America, the, um, from Colombia, the poverty increase in Colombia is more than twenty percent of the population is considered as in poverty, and that means disnutrition. That means uh, immunodeficiency, and that means more sensitivity to sensibility to the not only the coronavirus but all or whatever infectious disease that we can get. So my friend Angelo, who I met last year in Barbados, he's asking Dr. Ponce this question: the antigen test has added value, but negative results should be confirmed by PCR. 
However, most locations that perform an antigen test don't have resources to confirm my PCR. This can have issues for the false negative that still roam around. Do you see this as a problem from an infection prevention point of view? Yes, always does it. You have a, a, a COVID test or rapid test or whatever that rapid test you have. The, the risk and that the, the Dr. Francis said before, the sensitivity is lower than the PCR. This is, this is true. But the situation in this moment, if we need uh, today or yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine was a, a discussion about the test, what type of test we need. But the antigen test, you have the possibility to repeat the test. Um, mm -hmm. or for reopening the schools, you can do the test and random test every week to know which member of the community is positive. And then, on the other hand, there's some studies that when you have a, maybe you have a, your PCR test, in, the, in this way, your PCR test can detect the, the virus. But the investigation shows that not all the PCR test positive, principally when you have a high CT, that means that the patient is infectious. But with the antigen test, it's more mm, positive or more predictive positive value that the person or the is infectious. Yes? And then you have the, the to do the, the balance. Okay. Remember, not all the uh, PCR tests. You can get a negative PCR test when you start the infection. The, posit the positivity of the PCR is after two or three days than when you get the infection. Mm -hmm. No. And then, this is a, a very important discussion, principally for the laboratories, technician, laboratory, the medical microbiologists, and for public health. But usually, for example, in our lab, the uh, cutoff for the PCR is what means when you have a CT the 37. That means that you are in the recovery phase or you are in the initial, initial phase of the disease that you are increasing the viral load in, in this moment. And then in this situation, for me or for many clinical or microbiologists, in these cases that we have in CT more than the cutoff, for example, 37, we should repeat the test. But what about the cost? The cost is then any government have the financial resources to repeat and repeat and repeat the, uh, the PCR test. But this is important with the antigen test, which you can repeat the test. Excellent. Someone had asked a question about waste management, but I, I think they retracted the question, but I thought it quite an interesting um, um, thing to know because when everyone heard of COVID-19, everybody was running around, how should this building be? What requirements should there be for an isolation facility? And you made a very important point, Mr. Ponce, about having buildings ready, mm -hmm. especially healthcare facilities. Mm -hmm. So can you give us a little view of what waste management may look like in a healthcare facility? It doesn't have to be that in-depth, but just a little something. Yes, uh, the waste manage, management is very important, not not only in, in this uh, pandemic from COVID pandemic, it's all situation with COVID or without COVID pandemic, we need a, a very good waste management. Remember that 
for example, bacterial diseases. And uh, the other uh, pathologies and many uh, hospital waste go to the environment without previous previous disinfection. And then this is the, the reason that you that in sur uh, surface water or the lakes or high quantities of antibiotic or infectious micro and then this is but this is more expensive for the, the construction you know? but I think that we need to do the regulation for the because in a small a small island is the the risk is higher than the, the other situation. Remember for the small island we have for example desalinization of the water because we don't have uh, rivers, we don't have lakes in the small island desalinization. And then and if the hospital send the, uh, uh, the waste to the to the sea, it's possible that you get the the many microorganisms and then disseminate in the community for uh, for drinking water. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Yeah, the other point, remember that usually the uh, drink water treatment is principal for bacteria, micro bacteria microorganisms. But in no, no many countries are looking for viral infection or viral microorganisms or parasite microorganisms. And then this is an holistic vision of the waste management. So just a reminder that you would stay to the end to fill out the survey for your participation. And I would also like to remind you of the third and last mini series of the Caribbean Antimicrobial Stewardship Platform. And this would be held on November 18th and 19th. So uh, for both of you, I'm interested. How was shut down? Did you have shut down? I can tell you that here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, our prime minister was adamant that there would be no shutdown. So our borders were remained open, although there were no flights because everyone else was closed. Our borders were actually open. He believed that there was no need for curfews because he said the virus doesn't sleep at night <laughs> and we have no curfews. Although persons were encouraged to use facial coverings, masks, and social distances, physical distancing, all of that was done. And our, we never got to community spread of COVID-19. But tell me a little bit of your experience, both in Ohio and Columbia. How, how did that really go down for you guys, the shutdown, the curfews? And um, in Ohio, we have had it all. We had the curfew, we had the close down, we had the shutdown, we have had <laughs> a little bit of everything. Um, and 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 I have to say that when they did do that, they, it curved and flattened the curve in a way in terms of controlling infection and spreading of the disease here in Ohio. Um, as things have been opening back up, uh, we are back to having more cases. And as a matter of fact, today they were saying we're back to a, a high alert in hospitalizations and um, beds in, in ICUs and um, um, emergencies. Uh, so not sure what's gonna happen next in terms of um, if we're gonna have to be back into curfews and, and shutting down, but um, there's issues going on in terms of infection rates going up. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> I guess it remains to be seen uh, how they're gonna handle it. But um, it, it's as soon as the there was a lax in, in, in participation and in activities and restaurants opening and so on, um, absolutely the rate of infection has kind of crept up again. So not sure what's gonna happen next here. I have uh, other uh, remarks about the 
lockdown with the public health control that we have in this moment. For example, always you say to the community, stay at home. Don't go to the hospital if necessary. And I have the example and one small island of the Caribbean. For example, we have in Curaçao, one COVID death, one. But death for no medical attention, five, is the initial lockdown. And then, because we with the regulation, stay at home, but we don't prepare to attend the chronic diseases or other diseases that are very important. And then, how is you, if you do the, the lockdown and say the, the say the community stay at home, you need to do an alternative to attend the patients at, at home. Okay? And for example, the diabetes control, the, the patients that are taking anticoagulants or other infectious uh, disease or in pulmonary chronic obstructive disease or whatever, that is very risk. And they stay at home, but you don't have the capacity to do the monitoring all of one of these patients. And they, we need other points of view. We need to there implement point of care test. We need to implement the test at home, permanent uh, supervisor or that name now, health, uh, telehealth or telemedicine. Not only we need to stay in front and face to face with the patient, but we need to control them and detect what is the, the risk and when you need to go to the, the hospital. And then in, in this situation, many patients sent to the to home because this is a common call. And then in the next day, there well, we have the cadaver. Yeah. And then this is very important. Not only this is the, the, the reason, the holistic view, not only the infection control disease. And what about in this moment? We are in second wave of, of the COVID-19 that according to Dr. Fauci, the uh, USA is not second wave. We are still in the first one wave. We don't finish the, the first one. And then we start with the influenza season. Yes. And uh, since the, the last last year, PAHO informed all the countries that we were an epidemic year of dengue virus. Mm. The three diseases have initial similar symptoms, like a flu symptoms. Yeah. And in some islands in this moment, St. Vincent and Grenadine, we have mortality by dengue fever, oh, yeah. dengue fever. And then what to do in this? If our focus is only in COVID. We are not doing this for other diseases. Mm -hmm. Because the recommendation for the World Health Organization is to do other viral tests. If community, it is with, that was the reason that uh, in China, they detected the, the coronavirus disease because they did a panel, the viral infectious disease respiratory panel, all the panel was negative, but the people was dying from infectious disease or viral disease. And uh, this is the recommendation from the World Health Organization, but we are not doing this recommendation, only COVID. Um, in this drawing, is, this is not COVID, what is? And then send the patient to home, and then we will have a lot of deaths mm -hmm. in the next months. That's what they're calling it, the twindemic in the United States, the twindemic, having two, two things going on at the same time is so concerning. And flu being the main one. 
um, is creating a lot of stress here, um, anticipating what could be in, in, you know, and how can they handle it as a biggest challenge. It is a challenge, and yes, you spoke well of our St. Vincent, but we are doing testing. We've had over 800 confirmed cases of dengue. Mm. So it's, it's quite wow. outrageous, and I say to my students when I teach, medicine for you is gonna be so much more challenging because there's so many things that all look the same. Yeah, <laughs> similar so, symptoms, yeah. yeah. The symptoms, they all begin the same, so it's quite challenging, and that's why we have to rely on what comes from the lab, and we have to rely on asking the right questions to the public and giving the right public information. So it's a, an entire caveat of things, and rightfully said, it's a holistic approach. Yeah. So at this point, um, we're coming close to the end. I'm going to give you guys the presenters a chance to say your closing words, and then we would wrap up. Um, so from my part, I would say thank you very much for the opportunity to reach out to all the participants. Um, it's been a pleasure of mine to, to be here. Um, I thanks Farmipex for giving me the opportunity as well. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, uh, Meridian Bioscience has been in the business of uh, infectious disease for over 40 years. And we tend to have... Um, the opportunity to offer different products and an array of different products that can be used in covering many different infectious diseases and if respiratory diseases is more one of them as uh, area excuse me that we you know have multiple products so we do want to offer the laboratory a chance to test for not just one thing, but many potential things that can come across in their lab and then be able to get it from one vendor, one supplier, you know, that kind of thing. So we pride ourselves on having um, a pretty wide range of products that meet a lot of the needs that the laboratories have, especially in the infectious diseases side of things. And respiratory testing is one of them. Gastro is another Um pediatric testing and so on so thank you and and i uh, hope this was informative and um we can get the chance to do it again some other time i want to say similar that doctor is many thanks for the invitation and the opportunity and to the public health for governments or health insurance company that open the mind is not only the focus on a narrow focus or narrow vision, because the problem is the other complication or the recovery or other complication, and this is increase the cost. They think that they are lowering the cost, but it's not right. They are increasing the cost, and uh, for example, with the uh, uh, quarantine. How is the cost of quarantine in one patient or the, in the workers in this moment? It's very difficult and the economical capacity of the country is going down. Mm -hmm. And then you need to, to think with open mind to detect other infectious disease. Is, is that really that is important to detect the, the COVID and controlling the, the, COVID, the COVID because the mortality is high and the mortality exceeds the mortality the, the influenza in this moment is my one to five, more or less. To, and yeah. they, but with, uh, for example, for the influenza, the capacity to do the uh, 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 treatment with antiviral treatment in all, some cases. But, and then if you don't do the test of influenza or other disease, you lost the capacity to early recovery. Mm -hmm. Again, thanks a lot, invitation, and I hope to again the next time. So I want to say, say a special thank you to you, the presenters. We want to thank Lab Knowledge and Farm Flex for giving us this opportunity to learn more. There would be a link that would be posted for your survey. You will take the survey for participation. And please remember November 18th and 19th for the final mini-series. 
I thank you very much for casting from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> The Third Caribbean Antimicrobial Stewardship Conference is brought to you by BioMerieu, Meridian Bioscience, Lab Knowledge, and Farm and Pets.